Hi, I'm Aaron Sarofsky. And I'm Austin Shaw. This is Between the Keyframes. Episode 28, interview with Hung Lee and Ricardo Roberts at BN, an inclusive motion design studio. It's hello time. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Uh, we're here. We're here with Hung and Ricardo from BN Motion Design Studio. Super excited to get to chat with you guys today. So welcome. Welcome to Between the Keyframes. Thank you, Austin. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate it so much. Okay, guys, tell us about your background. Yeah. Now, we've gotten to know each other a little bit through the, what I call like the circuit, <laughs> the circuit of like other motion design studio owners and conferences and all of that. But um, I, yeah, I've been very inspired by you guys, not just like the work you do, but how you do it. And I think that's a little bit of what we're going to focus on here. But um, can you tell me how you guys met and how you decided to start a studio? Yeah, I'll take that one home if that's cool. So first off, Aaron, we're we're incredibly humbled by that, and we're humbled to be here with with both of you all. So just want to put that out there um, because we followed you way before being, and and you know you guys do stellar, amazing work, and and you're literally changing the industry. So. Um, again, we're just yeah. happy to be here. So Hung and I met because, so my background, I was actually a motion designer um, back in the day. That's kind of how I started. And I was working at a live action production company um, and we kind of had fallen on hard times. It was like in the um, mid 2000s, there was a recession happening and uh the owners at the production company said, Hey, like, we want you to do sales and marketing. We, we, we can't like, we want to keep you, we want to have you hang out, but there's no work to be done. So why don't you do sales yeah. and marketing? So I was like, shit. Okay. <laughs> I guess. And, <laughs> How um, do I do that? <laughs> and, yeah. And then, so I had to find a replacement, um, for a motion designer. And I had realized at that time, like I was like a meh motion designer. Like I just, I didn't have the talent to like go really, really far. So I wanted to find someone who was amazing. And so I, I started trolling the uh, MoGraph.net forum. Um, mm. MoGraph.net is a, like, it was a legendary place to meet other motion designers uh, back in the day. Yep. And so I met Hung on there and um, kind of the rest is history. Yeah. What year was that? Just want to context. I want to say it was like 2006. Okay, Something so early. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Was That's it 2006 awesome. home? Like it was back in the day. Yeah, and I think that was around that time when I started to freelance too. Yeah. So you you and I met online. We met online, right? We, we met, met online, online <laughs> in the, pretty That's much true when story. I decided to go freelance. <laughs> That's sort of around the same time Aaron and I met, right? Mid 2000s. 100%, 2006, 2007. Yeah. 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 But East Coast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you guys were on the West Coast. We no. are now, but back okay. then, uh, Ricardo was on the East Coast and I was in uh, Houston, Texas. Oh, so. gosh. Okay. Right on. Right on. And then I, I, I'm always okay. curious about hearing people's backgrounds too. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, Hung, like, well, how'd you get over to Houston and yeah, what was, yeah. what was happening there? Yeah. So, uh, I was born and raised in Vietnam. I did not leave Vietnam until I turned 16 or so. So, um, yeah, I, I was born right at the fall of Saigon, the end of Vietnam war. And my family had a very hard time living there because we were on the American side. Right. So when the communists took over, uh, we were not favored. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So in a way, we lived through poverty. Like we actually have to stand in line to get food, you know, and we had to sell things off to basically have money to buy things to survive. Yeah. So uh, we had such a hard time that um, my family at that time, which is my grandmother, who's 95 now and still living. Uh, she was like the matriarch of the family. So both my dad and my grandfather were in jail at that time. So she was like the 
matriarch and family and said, you know, this is not going to work. So we're going to start sending you guys off by boat. So we paid in gold so that we could leave the country in waves. So I actually um, did three attempts with my brother, my mother, and another aunt. And uh, we never made it. But the second time of the, the of that trip that we made, we tried to do, uh, we actually were captured by the pirates. And then they hauled us back and put us in prison. So kind of a, a cool question to ask, like, pirates do this? So, you know, it's just kind of all kind of questions you can raise there. So, you know, after three, that was only the second time we tried again. It's like, that wasn't enough. Yeah, what, what is it? You know, not dramatic enough for a kid. Let's do it again. Um, but like after three times, we said, oh, that was enough. But my dad actually tried 11 times and he made it uh, finally. And that's how he finally kind of sponsored us here when I was 16. You know, and then Houston, I, uh, I had a pretty humble beginning Sony graphic design locally. The University of Houston had a great graphic design program. The teachers came from Granbrook, so they brought that conceptual thinking, you know, to us. And uh, we, I, I had a great program there. Um, and yeah, so my first job happened to be at the TV station locally. And I fell in love with bright design. designer back then. You know, we all look at the same people, yeah, you know, the Greenberg and all those things. And we're like, wow, this is awesome. I would love to do this. And yeah, I, I worked locally thinking that I would stay locally in Houston because my family was there mostly. But uh, yeah, after a few years, I just said, you know what? It's time to break out if I want to learn. So go on MoGraph.net, put portfolio up there and say, I want to freelance. Right. And uh, and then uh, shortly after, actually, I put my portfolio up. Uh, Aaron, you didn't know this, but um, DK called me while I was still full time at my job. And they said, hey, and I saw your portfolio online. Can you come to, uh, you know, to the office, uh, you know, by, by Monday? And it was already Wednesday. <laughs> that sounds and like I, you can. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I just play I just play it cool. I said, yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that, there you go. That's how it started. Wow. Well, just like what an incredible, humbling story. I mean, I just I want to know more, you know, and there's so much more to talk about. But certainly when we do talk about um, diversity, inclusion, equity, it's kind of uh, in a way going to mean so much more coming from what somebody with such a a background with such a story literally captured yeah it. absolutely like, i mean it's like movies you know, i told we that story a, movie Aaron, in a way yeah 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 i think the story i did not want to bring it up like i say bragging rights in a way but no. it's kind of the foundation yeah for what we do now yeah and it certainly makes you realize like what we do is a privilege <laughs> like especially to be creatives and to create and just like as a baseline, wherever you're at, like what we are doing is a privilege. The fact that we get to choose and it just really starting is. just baseline. Yeah. 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 So, and that's yeah, just being where you're born, like just where you enter the universe is the, the factor yep. in that has nothing to do with anything other than that. So, well, the thing I thought about, and you know, I, I, I want to be sensitive and everything, is, is that you know when when like oh when like a a project goes awry and I'm complaining, I'm like man, <laughs> like Maybe I don't really not. have anything to complain about, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's where I was thinking with perspective. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Ricardo, what was your journey to finding motion design? Yeah, so my journey was very winding and very. Um, I guess different, but nowhere near along the level of things that Hung went through. Um, but so uh, my mom is Ecuadorian and my dad is American. So he was a Peace Corps volunteer and he went to Ecuador. He was actually, he fought in the Vietnam War. Um, and then he turned like peaceful. He was like, this is not for me. So <clears throat> he, um, he was in Vietnam. That's how he got his college education. Then he joined the Peace Corps. 
he met my mom and my mom at the time was uh, she was a director at a an orphanage in Quito in Ecuador. Um, so I was born there and lived there until I was like almost five. And then they both decided uh, to pack up and come to the States with my um, my brother and I. So we moved to Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, my dad got a job there. And, um, you know, basically like for me, we just moved there. I didn't know any English at all. Um, and, you know, back in the day, there was like zero Latino kids at school or really kind of in North Carolina period, um, uh, back in the early eighties. And yeah. And so like, it was this huge culture shock for me and it was like super difficult for me to assimilate and adapt. Um, and then I, I eventually did, you know, it took a lot of time, but I eventually kind of did adapt and I uh, got really big into hip hop, into music. And so I wanted to be a rapper and a uh, music producer and stuff. So I went to Full Sail uh, University in Orlando and I got there and I was like, yeah, I'm going to be an engineer. But but after doing it for a while and talking to people, I, I realized like I don't want to I don't want to like go to some studio in New York and get paid like eight dollars an hour to get coffee or whatever. You know, it's just like the investment I was paying for college, it was so high that I was like, ah, and they had this digital media program. So they were teaching 3D animation, After Effects, um, uh, Adobe Macromedia, you know, like all the old school stuff. And I was like, shit, that's what I want to do. I was like, I'm going to change majors. So I, I switched over and started learning about uh, digital media. So um, my college education was really like in in 3D animation. So I learned Maya, I learned Soft Image, um, 3D Studio Max. But when I graduated and moved back to Raleigh, there were no 3D jobs. So I was like, okay, what am, what am I gonna do here? And I got a job at a video production company and uh, I was doing After Effects. So I sort of knew After Effects, but I didn't tell them that. <laughs> but then, you know, like that's, that's basically how it happened. Um, I'm probably missing a lot of things in, in between here, but um, that was kind of my journey and how I, I got into motion design. It was very much a uh, kind of serendipitous. It was not planned out at all. I, I definitely identify with that because that was me too. Like I studied studio art and then I was gonna, I, my plan was to be an art teacher Right? I went to grad school for art ed. I was going to be a painter and, and, and teach kids like high school or middle school kids art. And then just randomly took an elective in grad school in design. It was just like, wait, what? Like, this is cool. And then I did a class in After Effects and it was like, I can make my drawings move. And then it was all over. But this was like right, right at, you know, around the year 2000 and the very early 2000s. And it was, it seemed like everyone I was meeting is, as I got into an internship, I interned at a studio called Curious Pictures. I don't know if you guys remember that spot, but yeah, like, but everybody was like either a graphic designer who was getting into it or somebody who studied three, maybe 3D animation or somebody who studied film. So we had this, all these different entry points that was such a, it was a very interesting, um, time I think and it sounds like I think we all kind of came in and around the same time yeah yeah around two, uh, 1998 is when I first got my first job when I was doing After Effects but you're right Austin it's like once you learn like oh I can make this stuff move then it's like man and I can do it on a computer at home yeah. you know it's like what so it's exciting times the old for blue sure. and whites <laughs> the blue and whites changed everything are they G3s or G something Oh, I remember those. Well, I had a G5. I remember when I had, I think that's what it was. It was yeah. a big tower. I think I, had, I came in a little after the, the blue and white ones. The Emacs? Oh my God. <laughs> was that what oh, it was? Wow. Like an Emac? <laughs> I don't yeah. remember that. Anyway. How did you start, Bien? I think also to own a business, you have to um, just be okay with uncertainty and risk. <laughs> so you guys, yeah. like, you know, with everything you've kind of traveled through and walked through, you're you're not risk adverse. You're probably very risk tolerant. And the upside, even even the downside is still an upside. It's still like a step on the journey to- Yeah, like, and I would I mean? agree with that. Like for me personally, I would say 
my ability to answer clients ask last minute now and try to come up with solution quickly i've been training training my whole life for it life. like by answering the door when a you know a communist police officer opened the door mm -hmm. and asking where your uncle is you know like that kind of stuff like you i've been training my whole life to <laughs> to pivot <laughs> and and make nothing make something out of nothing right yeah. i lie really well I, let's put it that yeah way. you think on your feet you just <laughs> go right into that mode except like obviously the stakes are not life and death here it's like are you going to get it by four or are you going to get it by four <laughs> thirty? You right. know, it's like, I think we're okay. You know, it's, you know, wow. Yeah. But, but it is risky having a business, but yeah, you know, again, the context is so, so different. Can you tell us a little bit about VN and, and you know, what, what sets you guys apart, what you think makes yourself different and how you, how you approach business and the kind of work you do stylistically, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Aaron. So, so we started BM five years ago. So we're we're proud to have made wow. it through those five years. Congratulations! Um, yeah, that's a big <laughs> achievement. Yeah, I know, I know, yeah. I know, and and I don't take it lightly. We're we're very grateful to to be here and and to you know do what we do. But when we started the studio, we did a lot of you know thinking, competitive research, and there's a million motion design studios, and there's people who have you know have done it or are doing it at the highest level so we always thought like what can we do differently and so we always went back to our roots like who are we as people what's our unique point of view and my my mom actually um did cultural diversity training like that was that was what she did um for a large part of her career and so i always was like super interested in that and i've always been a type of person where i love learning about different cultures um, and traveling. And I, I grew up with friends from all over the world. And I thought like, maybe there's something there. Maybe that that's a way that we can differentiate. And, you know, you look at the world and where things are going, like it's becoming much, much more diverse, not just in the United States, but on a global level. And so Hung and I were like, you know, what about this concept of inclusive design? How can we how can we kind of port it over to motion design? How can we embrace it and build on it? So we came up with this idea of inclusive motion design. And it was built on the foundation of, of what was happening at the time at Microsoft. So there was inclusive design. They, they applied it to uh, primarily hardware video game stuff. Um, and then um, also some of IDEO's human-centered um, design mm -hmm. thinking principles. We, we kind of wrap those things into inclusive motion design. And um, when we started, no one cared. <laughs> no one cared. <laughs> no, they were like, what is that? And it's like, why is that important? And we would you know, try to educate uh, clients and, and let them know that like the, the world is changing, the world is becoming more diverse. Like this is something that's important. Um, and it, it didn't really take off. Uh, so we struggled like big time for the first probably two years. Um, mm -hmm. And then George Floyd happened. Um, and when that happened, um, people got really interested in working with minority owned uh, studios and having, you know, a, a, a different perspective, a different POV. And that's when we sort of like started taking off in terms of like momentum and stuff like that. Um, but, yeah. but in general, that's like our whole, uh, you know, that, that's our POV and that's our mindset is everything we do, look at the lens of diversity and inclusion um, and do it on screen, but also behind the scenes. Yeah. So that's really what we do. Hong, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I would say when we formed the end, we wanted to build this like into the business itself. We did not want to say, let's make a marketing statement right. to differentiate, right? We, from day one, we wanted to make sure that we will practice what we preach, right? And we want, we actually made that part of our business, the core of our business. And I think a lot of it had to do with like our backgrounds. I think I, met, I mentioned my background growing up. Yeah, of course. You know, I think when I grew up in Vietnam, experiencing oppression and discrimination of a different kind 
I could relate it to the American experience. Ricardo and I, when we came together and we compared notes, you know, trading war stories, we would say, you know, notice how oftentimes we were the only minority people in the room in post-production. Mm -hmm. So there was something there. And, you know, like, so that when we hone into this concept, that was like a big part of what we wanted to do. And the stats at the time and until now for the industry does not look that great in terms of diversity. Yeah. I yeah, wanted to a, ask one thing. Oh, oh go ahead. yeah. Well, real quick, just before I forget, there was because because Hung being Vietnamese and then Ricardo, when you would mention that your father had been in the Vietnam War too, and 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 just how you guys came together, is that a point that you guys had connected on? And to me, that was just there was something interesting there, and just wanted to dig into that a little, if that's okay. Yeah, man. I would say this: like when Hung and I started working together, it just like we just clicked. Like, like, I mean, we just became fast friends and then we started like learning about each other's backgrounds and stuff. And that really kind of was like, that's weird. You know, that that's an odd coincidence. There's definitely something here. Um, so I, I would say absolutely, man. It's just, you know, again, I'll say serendipity, I guess, the second time on this podcast. But it just, you know, these things happen. I think they happen for a reason. And. Um, that bond and that that friendship that we had, you know, that's going on like I don't know, fifteen years almost, yeah. um, is real. And Austin, yeah, Austin, I would add that we complement each other in this way too, right? I came from a world where Western media was kept out completely for years. We, I did not watch one Disney movie until I turned twelve, and it was behind closed doors and it shut the you know windows and in a government building, but it was weird. I watched the very first Disney movie in a government building because only the government would have access to, you know, all the stuff that they confiscated yeah. from people and they all shut the windows on that stuff. So I had, I would consider myself coming into our industry with an outsider's point of view because I just did not know anything about popular culture in America, period. Like I would go and listen to music from, you know, Nine Inch Nails and whatever, old school music just to brush myself up on American culture. Well, Ricardo uh, entrenched in the hip hop community in North Carolina. He got the insider track, but from the minority point of view, you know, so that's kind of how we see our POVs kind of jive well together. Yeah. And, and also, like, I went back to live in Ecuador as an adult. So uh, in the early 2000s, I, um, I went back and I was still doing motion design, but living in Ecuador. So even though I grew up here, I'd always gone back to Ecuador and then I lived there for uh, three or four years. I got married there. So I've, I've always had like an international perspective. That's just me. Like if you know anyone who knows me well, um, I, I have friends from all over the world and I love it. So. Uh, that's a, that's another thing is just like being curious, being open, um, being inclusive. Like that's just just who we are. I mean, the world is getting smaller. When I started the studio, like we worked with maybe one or two people in in the UK, and usually they came over here. And it was you know now it's like pew 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 like everywhere all over the world. Like I hear people talking different languages. I, you know, you do a quick Google Translate. You're okay. like the tools are there, the resources are there. The world got smaller. How you pay people is super easy now, unless they're in a communist country. But like, you know, <laughs> but there's that too. You know, you like you want to be like, and sometimes it's a little challenging just from a technical logistics standpoint. But there are ways to figure it out, and we've been we've been more open to it here. So. Yeah, globalization, yeah. like it's so it it's um, expanding and evolving rapidly, you know, especially with the pandemic, you know, like we work with talent so all much. over the world. And and that was also one of our yeah. key uh, tenants or, or beliefs early on is like good talent exists everywhere and everywhere. they have a different international point of view. And if brands are more global, I think I think any big brand now, they have to be extremely global right so to have a global audience but not have you know a global uh, uh, team it doesn't make a lot of sense you know um, and and something that I wanted to bring up to Aaron was like 
you know, when I was in school at Full Sail, I think there were two women in our class. If that, yeah. I think there was two or three. Yeah, two. And so like, that's an issue. Like it's, it's been a boys, boys club in motion design for forever and ever. Now I see it changing, but like, that's something that we are not okay with. It's not, it's not cool. Like that, that has to change. And, and we are working towards that, you know, it's, it, so I just wanted to get your perspective too, Aaron, cause I know, you know, you, you've been through a lot too. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting, it's like, it's hard to compare with um, your all struggle. You know, your all struggle. I went. I grew up on Long Island in a pretty privileged household, and then went off to RIT in Rochester, New York, where my parents paid for it. Um, you know, when I got into the world, it's like I didn't see it because all I cared about was the work. I'm not kidding. I was just you, you know this chubby blonde girl that just worked. I loved the work. Um, and, but there were only a couple other women around me that were on the creative side. I'd never had a female creative director or creative lead in any capacity. They're just, it just wasn't. And, and it's not just that it wasn't on our side of the business. Like when you looked at the ad agencies and the clients hiring us, it was still rare to see a female lead, creative lead. Um, you know, and like I could get into all the whys, like, but I, it doesn't really matter. Like I was just like, you know, one of very few women at Digital Kitchen and, and, and I think in the industry at that time achieving. And then, you know, moving through, like, I, I don't know what, what like about me made me, it's interesting, like it wasn't this idea that I wanted to own a company that made me start the business. <laughs> It's also nice because I own it. It's all mine. I get to decide. I'm the decider. And it's nice to not have partners, no offense. Because for me, uh, the yeah, I've, I've found it like it, there's a niceness in a matriarchy. And like being a woman, I really do consider what people think. And I really uh, find people that compliment me personality wise and skill set wise. And it's not things are just very thoughtful how they're done. And if there's a risk that's going to be made, I know it's kind of my neck and my house on the line, you know, and I know, and I feel good that it's not, well, my partner's apprehensions and he's got a wife that's pretty high maintenance. And how's she going to feel when I want to like spend a hundred grand on a build out or something like that? Cause that's their money too. So I like knowing that like, it's, it's all my neck on the line every day. Yeah. Yeah, I bet I bet that's I awesome, and I bet it can get also lonely sometimes. Like, I mean, it's pros and cons always, right? Like with Hung yeah. and I, we'll, yeah, we'll have disagreements for sure, but I mean, we we always work through them and get over them. But like on our end, like it would be scary for me to have to make all of the decisions, you know? Like it's yeah. for for us, it's like great to be able to bounce back and forth. So, but I yeah. think it's just dependent on the person too, because it would be awesome just to you know just to make a decision and do it and not have to, you know, think about it and, and, and yeah. so many different perspectives involved too, you know? Yeah. See, I get, I get overwhelmed for me being the non, you know, larger studio owner in this mix. I admire and respect is to me, I always, the, the idea of the responsibility of like, Oh wow. I got all, all these, like when I talk to Aaron and I think about, you know, you got people's, their, their livelihoods yeah. and, and feeling responsible yeah. for that. That, that to me always feels pretty overwhelming. And you have to take risks. Like you have to constant, like, are we going to bid? Are we going to pitch that? Like a pitch is going to be expensive. Do we have the money for that? Should we, should we not spend it on that? Should we go in with a little mini treatment? Like, yeah. You know, there's not just your jobs on the line. There's like a lot of people. So yeah, right. lots to yeah. consider. But I love that saying: "Scam money, don't make no money." You know, <laughs> so you gotta pull the trigger sometimes. Yeah, you do. Always, always telling me that. I want to bring it back. <laughs> yeah, scam money, don't make money. <laughs> Is there enough diversity? <laughs> I was just gonna bring it back to the whole, the whole, the question about just just female representation and and. I'll just from the educator point of view, right? Because I have, you know, coming in early 2000s, right? Definitely the boys club. Um, seeing a lot of female 
producers, not as much female motion design talent. And then teaching at SCAD for 10 years and watching over time as the percent, you know, where maybe it was 50-50, like male, female. And then over time, it was really more female than male students, mm -hmm. right? And now I'm over here in, in, in Washington, Western Washington University. I'm in a more generalist design program. I'm bringing a lot of the, the motion classes there. I'm helping there. But we're way, like, right now we have a new, uh, we switched a new BFA cohort. There's like... 80 90 percent female students and in, and it's not everybody's necessarily going straight to motion design but just design i mean it's it, the representation there is very female and and yeah i guess that bigger question and and it's one of those things i try to advocate for female students is is how how do you how do you negotiate for yourself in in, yeah. in a culture that is kind of male, yes. male dominated and and hearing from the career advisors for years too that it's like a male student gets an offer they they negotiate female student gets an offer they take it without the negotiation and and mm -hmm. yeah how to how to address that yeah i find it interesting that I think the trend has been going on for quite some time that the students in school are more female, but that doesn't necessarily translate into real world once they graduated. Because I think the way we work is very demanding. The schedule is very demanding. I think uh, if you are a female and you are career obsessed, you have to forego a lot of family planning, you know, other things that not all the women are willing to do you know, for careers and, and even uh, the culture of work is more like a ta I mean, tailor and, and structure for the, yeah. the dudes, it's for the bro culture all this yep. time. So I think it's going to take quite uh, some time before all that would change. And also, you know, Aaron, you know this, right? If you don't put in the work, you're not going to make great work. So, you know, I mean, we, we can say try to chill, but if you don't put in the work, you don't put in the hours, you can't do that. Yeah. Don't make anything good. Yeah, there there definitely are considerations for women that men don't have. Like, you know, me, I had a baby at forty, <laughs> which is I would are not ideal. It's <laughs> just not ideal from a physical, a mental. <laughs> like I think all the time, like, oh my god, if I see my baby at forty, when she's forty, I'm gonna be eighty. God, that's that gives me pause. So I think, you know, there's something about just the, and also that's like very late to be having kids just from like a biological standpoint. And now having kid, understanding just what that means, <laughs> that, you know, as like a, a real conversation starter, it's like, I have this company and it's like so important and there are so many lives and it's still so important. But what happened is this other mountain got put on top of it. So all the energy that I had to put into my studio, I was still putting into my studio, but now I'm also putting all this energy and attention and focus into my daughter, you know, and my family, making sure that's like a healthy place. And so it is not shocking that, um, once women see what it's like, especially at the entry point, like the price point of entry, which is, I would say, lower than most other fields, you know, uh, I mean, it has the potential to make you a ton, ton of money, but um, a very, very nice living. But in the beginning days, in the first five or six years, you're getting going, you know. Um, and so if if you're coming out and your partner is in more of like an Accenture type thing and they're going to start out making 80, 90 grand a year. Obviously, you're the one that's going to be home, you know, and there's just also just the dynamics, the physicality of what's going on with your body when you choose to have children. And then and then, you know, technology moves so fast, it's really scary to get back in. So if you take a year break, which is is that enough? I don't know. Like our how we handle, um, you know, being out for for after having a baby in the U.S. is very unhealthy. Companies yeah. like us are not subsidized by the government, you know. So yeah. it would I would love to be able to give somebody like a year or six months 
but like nobody's given me anything. So that's literally like ha like a salary that I'm all of a sudden paying. And as a small business, that's not like the greatest. So it would be amazing if like the government did do something to support families. Um, yeah, yeah, Aaron, and, 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 like and you, certainly that's the big. Yeah, you, well, I was got just gonna other... say that's a big human right. Yeah, it's a human rights issue, really. You it know? is. Yeah, and you've got yeah. other countries like Ecuador that pays for, um, I think it's a year maternity leave, right? Like these are yeah. these are small, you know, third world countries, and and they're doing these things. So why the hell is not isn't that happening in the United States? But that that's like a bigger. This is like yeah. a bigger topic for us. Is like one thing that we always tell people is, you know, diversity and inclusion is so much more than ethnicity, and even gender. Mm -hmm. It's about age. It's about ability. Yep. It's about just background, sexual preference. Um, you know, there's so many things that we include in this idea of, you know, disability, yeah. or sorry, uh, of inclusion and, and diversity. And like, for example, uh, the world's largest minority group is people with disabilities. Right. So, so there's 1 billion people on earth today with some form of disability. And that's 15% of the population. So that's something that we're also advocating for and that we're, we're pushing hard to, you know, give people with disabilities a voice, um, advocate for them, and, you know, just in general, push for more diversity all around. And, and, and that, that goes for, yeah. you know, so many different population groups. Yeah. A hundred million percent. A hundred million percent. And there's so many kinds of disabled. Like that definition is so vast, you know. Well, and also it seems like I, I know with, with you all, it's like the, the pillars of inclusive motion design, right? Is it like accessibility as, as I don't want to say that's the solution, but I guess the the word to describe that solution. And, and I don't know, what are, or what are some of the potential solutions for for representation and, and uh, you, you know it's a really disability yeah yeah it's a super deep topic and we don't have all the answers like hung and i um we never pretend to have all the answers we we say up front like this is a very new thing even even on the corporate side like just dei initiatives in general are like five to seven maybe maybe 10 years old so we're we're all trying to figure it out as we as we do this right but one of the the main things is just like it's just representation in general right like it's just being able to see yourself in someone else and say i can do that right so like societal norms um traditionally have told us like these are the type of people who do x y and z and if you're if you're not one of those types of people forget about it you're not gonna right. you're not gonna make it to do x y or z um and so like that's why i've been so excited to see a lot more representation in movies and in TV, right? So now you can you can you can go to the movies. You can see a female lead. You can see you know a black lead. You can see an all black cast, and the movie still does extremely well on a global scale. And yeah. that's something that I always talk about. Is like I think it was with um, with um, Independence Day with Will Smith when none of the movie heads wanted to hire or put Will Smith in the lead role because they thought it wouldn't play for international audiences, right? So there's some undertones of, of racism happening there. But now that there was um, the director and the studio fought really hard for Will Smith and it turned out to be this huge blockbuster, right? And so now you've got movies like Black Panther and so, so many, there's too many to name now that yeah. have proven that, that you know, people from diverse backgrounds can lead movies and can be behind huge blockbusters, global blockbusters, right? The, the world is changing, the mentality is changing, the, the, the view on a global level has changed. And that's really interesting, it's really powerful, and it's something that has inspired Hung and I, just in general. It's like, it's not the 1940s or 50s or 60s anymore. So, so we all have to adapt to that. Yeah. Well, that first, I mean, and I mean, yeah, just to dig deeper into that first pillar of the, the mo inclusive motion design principles, representation. Mm -hmm. I mean, even just, just 
for me reading that and thinking about it, that idea of representation on screen and behind the screens and, and then bringing it into motion design. So, and it's easy, it's easy to take it for granted from, from my, my point of, of privilege, right? But to really think about, oh, okay, like showing those diverse people on screen, even if it is graphics, right? Illustration yeah. Oh, yeah. and, and yeah. uh, yeah, because like Austin, like if if you grow up or, or if you grow up outside of the U.S., right? Like if if you go to you know Ecuador, Vietnam, India, um, Africa, like any any country outside of the U.S., you look at the advertisements, you look at the movie stars, celebrities, they're either they're either white or they're the lightest skinned uh, people from from that yeah. particular that particular particular country. Right. And so you grow up thinking that that that's better than you, that that's right. That's what you want to be. And so those are some of the the social activism um, components of what we're doing at BN. And that's why representation is so important. So that's all changing. It hasn't changed, you know, fully. Um, but just that representation, it seems so trivial almost if you're not really thinking up about it. But psychologically, if you're constantly exposed to that day in, day out, that's what you believe growing up. You believe that you, you can't do that because yeah. that person doesn't look like me. Or just the idea yeah, of what I, beauty I is. I also think, yeah, I, I think we of... cannot also take what we hear for granted. Like you say, representation on screen, come on. We have plenty of that nowadays. I mean, there's a Forbes article uh, this year, like early this year, saying that representation on screen when they analyze the commercials actually dropped compared to a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. you know, so you might see more, but that doesn't mean that there, there is more. It's just that, you know, it's a push and pull constantly. And would that representation on screen be concentrating in one sector? In this case, live action is what we see the most. Mm -hmm. But if you talk about what we do in motion design, that's not necessarily the case. And if it does happen, it happens on a, what I call like a checkbox level. Like let's put some people of color on the screen. We're good, we're done. But diversity is so much more than that and you have to be more nuanced. Yeah, well there's also like body diversity. Like whenever we're doing illustrations, I'm yeah. like thicken that girl up. <laughs> put a mole yeah. over there. Like, yeah. like I'm just like, let's just like redefine beauty mm -hmm. into the personal style like it's not necessarily about body type it's about like what they are exuding right so to play around with different body types not just ethnicity and all that stuff. well it's interesting i'll say i mean i just and, and i'm not sure we could always bleep it out but I'm, i just finished working on um Right, so I don't know if I'm supposed to say it or We're not. If I worked on it, but out. we are definitely okay. okay. They do that. not like so, that. All right, well, all right, I'll start. Okay, I'll I'll start this. I'll say I've been working with a. I, I just did some some company. some work for a tech company for a tech company. Was... No, but what's really interesting is that the illustration library that we were given to work with, and and a lot of the rounds of revisions before it even I was even given the green light to animate was that they wanted they wanted more diversity they wanted to yeah. show somebody you know in 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 a, in a wheelchair and they wanted to show somebody with a different body type and they wanted to make yeah. sure that there was enough and and so it seems like at least at at some level internally they have they're they're conscious of and they're thinking about it and they're mandating it i thought that was cool you know what my favorite thing recently was is i went to buy some tank tops on uh, at old navy on, online and you uh, could do a search, but then you could look at the garments in the search, like all the icons in a small, in a large, in a double extra large and the model changed and you, you like actually saw what it was gonna fucking look like on you. Not some like tarantula sized human, you know? And I was like, yeah. exactly, exactly. And it, you know, it, it like really impressed me. A lot of these brands have not only embraced, I don't know, it just makes you feel human again. It made me feel human. I was like, oh, I felt like very seen and very human. Like I mattered when I saw that, yeah. Yeah, like you matter, like you're seen. And that's yeah. so important, Aaron. And, yeah. and like I, yeah. I 
also go back to social media, right? And say, okay, you know, social media is good and bad, of course, but um, it, I think it's changed, especially Generation Z, like their view, like they don't, they reject anything that's like polished and overly corporate. Like they love to, to see and hear from people who have a variety of different, um, you know, just looks in general from different countries, mm-hmm. um, you know, from different backgrounds. So people want that now. Whereas before, you know, the 70s and the 80s, it was all about perfection and it was all about these super skinny mm-hmm. models who look perfect. People don't want that anymore. Like, mm-hmm. like my kids, my, yeah. my daughter is 13, right? Like she, she hates that kind of stuff. Like, you know, it's, it's got to be authentic. It's got to be real. It's got to be, you know, just people being who they are. Like, I, I believe yeah. that seriously, that that has been a huge cultural um, paradigm yeah. shift. Yeah. You know, I have a I have a 13 year old daughter, too. So it's it's interesting, too. I mean, yeah. and she likes she likes to go to the thrift store. She wants to buy clothes from the thrift store. Yeah. I'm like, really? That's cool. Yeah. You know, and, and it's and it might just be where we are in this little kind of blue uh, enclave here in, in in Bellingham, Washington. But, you know, like they, they're in middle school. They have a huge LGBT q plus club right like i mean and it's and it's supported and it's really active and it's i mean it's encouraging for me but i then i i just went back in my mind and i'm like okay so I, about that that tech company that i did the did some ads for and i'm like what level is this how do i discern what's like is this just mandated and they're doing it because they have to or is this performative or is this authentic and does it doesn't matter matter. and does it matter is my question as long as it's happening i think so commerce is always going to be the leading edge of why um something happens like there's a shift happening right like the point is, if it matters to people, it's going to matter to the companies. And I think, you know, Hung made a point earlier about, you know, like media being still more white hetero biased. And if you look at our country, that's not shocking why. We're seeing what we're supposed to see because of the channels we look at, because of the networks we're on, because of the platforms we're on, because of the bubble we share all our information in and how how ads are targeted towards us. But like somebody in alabama ain't seeing that (laughs) they're seeing what they're what they're needing to see to buy the thing that they're needing to buy and um but i do think that companies like the big tech companies that have a big global footprint in so many ways like in every way because so if you if you think of a company like um i'll use apple for example um they they own the devices they own the things that you look at the things on they own the content now that's being shown on them with their streaming network um so they're going to own the whole network of of what you look at and how you receive it so what i'm saying is they have an obligation as far as i'm concerned to make sure for whatever it could be a noble reason or a not noble reason um to make sure people are represented because they're in hands all around the world. They're creating content for people all around the world. So, you know, it's, I think it's just really, they have a moral obligation to lead in that way. And when, when you have giant media companies like Fox news and things like that, just go on the absolute other way. It just makes me insane. Mm. It just makes me insane because I've, like it makes me proud to hold an Apple product and to have made a film for them a while back because it's what I believe and I want to see them reflecting the beliefs I have. So I, whether they have all their executives and everything with those personal beliefs, I don't really care so long as that they're moving in the right direction and the right direction is, is you know, seeing different people on TV. For yeah. sure. I, I think the to bring it home a bit, right? The consumers are changing. Yep. So the people who make the products are they also changing to adapt. I think the question mm-hmm. is, the mo- is the motion design industry changing fast enough yep. right. to keep up with and to understand the nuances and the cultural differences uh, to appeal to the new audience? Yes. Well, the answer is probably no. 
right? Like, I mean, how could it? Because it's, it's yeah, got such a long way to go. Yeah. I would say that, you know, a lot of times people think of like, oh, you know, this is an American problem. Uh, it's probably because too many studios are run by Caucasian Americans, so therefore they cannot change. But I think you can look at this as a global problem. Um, a lot of designers and companies around the world, they want to work with American companies like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, you name mm -hmm. it, right? So they have adapted to appeal to certain things that they think the American customers or, or companies mm -hmm. wanted them to do. So they cater to that, to that taste and they yeah. change their view, the way they do things to, to, to appeal to that. Mm. Cater to it, yeah. So, so what does I mean, success I, look like? Yeah. How do we, how do we evolve? Yeah, I, I would say it's kind of like for all of us to, to kind of understand our audience better. Yeah, uh, I think we all can gain better understanding of like what our customers really want besides just Googling like, oh, what do people in China want? You Google it, right? And the best way to learn that is basically to expand your network, to bring in people with really different perspectives than your own, you know, to be part of the process. Uh, that's, a, that's what we try to, to, to advocate for is the idea of design with, not for. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. Design with, not for. Let's talk about that. Ricardo, you want to take this one? Yeah. I mean, basically, it just means that if, if you're designing or creating, it's, it's, it's for anything, right? If you're designing, you're creating, you're filming, you're shooting, you're producing, any kind of content you're creating, um, if it's for a, a specific audience, you want to make sure that you have someone from that audience represented on your team. And so that's why when we talk about inclusive motion design, it's, it's really uh, important to talk about representation on screen, but also behind the scenes. Because without an inclusive and diverse team behind the scenes, you can't create content on screen for that audience, right? So um, yeah. how do you do that though? So, you know, obviously we talked about the industry is not very diverse, but what we have started doing with the design with not for mentality is bringing on consultants. So it's, it's impossible without lived experience to create something that is authentic to a particular audience. You, you have to have someone from that audience on the team. So you can just hire a consultant. And we've done that, like we do a lot of international work. So we do a lot of stuff for the uh, Indian market, for example. And so okay. instead of just Googling stuff or, you know, calling a friend and asking them, we hire uh, consultants from India, from that market. And we yeah. make sure that the ideas, the creative, the concept, et cetera, is true, is authentic. It is up to date. You know, it's not stereotypical. It's like real, real deal stuff. So in yeah. general, uh, design with not for is something that we want everyone to take away from this podcast that's listening. It's super, super important. Um, and that's why it's so important that we as studio owners and I would say influencers, Austin, like in our industry, um, that's why we have to, to talk about these things and think of ourselves as a, a bridge, a bridge studio or someone who can unearth opportunities and spread them throughout the industry and, and give others opportunities. So instead of thinking about what is, a, is talent going to do for us, we think about what are we going to be able to do for talent and act as a bridge to other opportunities. That's awesome. Curious with, uh, with when you hire a consultant for a project like that, so is that, would that be like a motion designer or would it be like, like what is that consultant role or does that I, depend? Yeah, I can take that one. I think that one, um, the role would depend. So if the stars align, then uh, you know, it would be a beautiful uh, mixture. You can bring on a, a designer who knows the culture really well and couldn't be part of the process. And we have done that in the past and it worked out beautifully um, because uh, you can actually do many things at once, right? You are giving that person opportunity to work on something really amazing. 
at the same time, mm-hmm. while you know, giving you something even more amazing in return is the cultural authenticity. Um, so, you know, it, it, it could work out like that, but if you cannot find such opportunities, then you can bring on a cultural consultant. Um, like we had worked on a project where we had to illustrate a non-binary character. Okay. And we don't have someone like that on staff. And it's not easy for you to go out and say, I'm looking for a non-binary designer. Do you, you know anyone? You know, that's, that could, that's not great either. So, you know, you, in that case, you, you actually, we just luckily enough that we knew someone who was a teacher um, and, and they were the right person to, to, to consult on that. And they were on board with us to be a consultant and just like review our work, give us tips, do Zoom calls with us, the, all those things you know, just to talk it out. You know, I think this this formula is not um, it's not new, right? Pixar, all the big studios have been oh, doing yeah, this do. yeah. to make movies. Absolutely. Now, that, that idea for me, I mean, as a, a, a cultural consultant, right? Whatever that culture happens to be, finding somebody who can who can speak to it and inform and, and bring the authenticity on. Right on. Well, like how naive to think that somebody wouldn't have that (laughs) that you're going to just create this project for this audience have no experience with it i mean like when you watch movies from like the 80s you're just like oh Oh, my god watching like a john hughes movie now you're just like was somebody just not there that had any sense of like what so i think you know at least here when we we might not go as deep making it a part I, I i would say that like though it's not necessarily like a part of like our ethos but we wouldn't make such a misstep as to not <laughs> check ourselves to make sure that we you know we would definitely make sure somebody's eyes were on it that that um could let us know like are we like what are we doing here like before we start can you talk to us about what your experience is like, or if there's anything we should understand about how somebody would communicate, or, you know, and I'm thinking about specific things. So I'm just, uh, yeah, I feel like the older we get, or at least for me, the older I get, the more I know that I don't know. <laughs> like you come in, you know, like you think you know everything when you're a teenager, and then you get into college and you're like, oh, this is interesting, I'm learning, I'm absorbing. And then you you get good at your profession, so you know, or at least you, you know how to know, you know, I know how to get that tutorial. I know what they're thinking and I know, well, well. and then like you kind of hit this other layer of like, oh, forget it. Like I had no idea (laughs) and I, I'm never going to presume ever again. Like this, like the smartest people I know are just questioners, people that question and ask questions because that's, that's how you get somewhere. Yeah. I was going to say, too, with what, what you were just saying, Ricardo, that like, and maybe it's this, I, I keep, I, I like to think it's hopeful. I hope it's not like a naive hope, but this idea of, you know, a rejection of, of the, these different kinds of myths, right? Whether it's a beauty myth or the, mm-hmm. um, the myths that, and, and that media really, you know, pushes out. Yeah. to to a culture to a populace and and whether and, and that there is a, a craving for more authentic stories or more that that can even if they're diverse they're personal but the personal speaks to everybody right that personal experience wow. yeah that that's so true well, Austin. it's like we're all humans we're and we're way more alike than we are different like that's the key core thing to keep in mind here um you know they're human stories no matter what they are still human stories and i think people are a lot more open and welcoming to those stories now than maybe 30 40 50 years ago and in fact they're very much in demand you know people want those stories you see that with with the you know the type of uh media that's coming out and being released these days and what's popular on you know Netflix and, and TikTok and yeah. YouTube. Like, it's happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a million, billion percent. It definitely I guess I have, I have a, 
a selfish question for so as an educator, right? Educating, working with designers and motion design students, and and just asking like, all right, so what can I do? Like, what? How can I help advance a more inclusive um, future for for design students? Yeah, um, you know, I would, I wouldn't presume to tell you what to do, right? We can only kind of draw from our personal experience. Uh, Ricardo and I have been teaching inclusive motion design to a hyper island in Stockholm the past a couple of years. And Aaron, we invited you to the first one we did. Um, so, you know, we have seen the changes that the students have told us afterwards. It's like, you know what? We cannot look at the work uh, the same way before anymore. And I think that's where it starts, right? People coming out of school, knowing that the world they want to create aligns with their ideals, not what they were taught or seen in media now, but what they want to see coming out later. So I think it starts with that, right? Just kind of like have students understand the importance of this as a social impact that they can make themselves uh, coming out of school and partake in our industry will make a huge impact 10 years down the road. And and I think that it's kind of, in a way, I would say it's common sense, right? We just kind of bring people back to common sense. Like, look, you look like this. I look like this. Why do we do things like this? That doesn't make sense, right? And in the age of TikTok and Instagram, I think that the expectations of the old days are gone. You know, you Aaron, you remember when we worked in broadcast design and the, Everything had to be this level of quality and polished voiceover has to be sound like this or it's not good. You know, I think we can kind of <laughs> see that as like the past and we have to move past that. Yeah, and I think we have a uh, methodology that we, we have to uh, help people see things kind of differently. Like Ricardo and I have come up with a way, we, we hold workshops about this, about inclusive motion design, how tactical you can do it on every step of the way. And we don't think of diversity in, in the way that, just like Ricardo said, ethnicity, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not the goal here. That's not the only goal. I think that for the United States, we definitely have a lack of uh, African-American and Latinx talents, period. You know? And if you lack those perspectives, then your work cannot be as diverse, right? So it's just a matter of like, it's almost like math. If you increase more diverse perspectives, the work would be more interesting and creative because then you're offering the world new things that haven't been seen before from people who have different views. So by doing that, I think if we can encourage more people from uh, minority groups joining the industry, we see a big shift. And uh, we, have, we also think about um, inclusion as like every step of the production process. Before we, you know, at the discovery call, when we talk internally, like it should be weaved into the production process every step of the way. And not just like, wait till we, before we deliver to the client say, hey, did we check all these boxes? Right, that would be too late. Yeah, yeah. one way we look at it too, Austin, is like there is a definite monoculture in design today. And we, we want to see that change. So what can we do to make that change? So, so many of the things that we do uh, revolve around mentorship. Um, it's, it's bringing on young, diverse designers, whether it's informal or whether it's a formal um, mentee-mentor relationship or it's like an apprenticeship or even an internship is, is seeking out those diverse talents, bringing them on and then and then teaching them the ropes, showing them the ropes and going out of your way, like actually putting in a lot more work uh, as a studio owner um, to to support them, to make them feel comfortable, to let them know that they are welcome, that their voice matters, that they can contribute not only to their industry or to the design, but society as a whole. Right. So like like working, taking time out to work with them um, is, is a huge part of what we do. And then another thing is uh, Double the Line. So Double the Line is an initiative uh, that was started by AICP, 
Um, and it was intended to be uh, for live action, right? So basically for them, it's like, hey, you know, if, if there's a, um, uh, you know, a, a DP, then you should try to double your line item for that DP and bring on a diverse talent so that they can shadow that uh, senior DP. And so we've kind of taken that and we've adapted it to motion design. So um, for example, for like cell animators, right? So, uh, or, or 3D animators. And you know that there's like an elite bunch of people um, and that elite bunch is unfortunately not very diverse. So we take a junior diverse designer and double the line, pair them with a senior talent. And what happens is something that's amazing. That junior talent, they get that experience of shadowing someone, right? They get that confidence of being on a big job. But most importantly, they get that piece on their reel. And that's the problem. There's a concrete wall into our industry. You can't get work without having the work. So that's why we look at ourselves as a bridge studio. It's like, this is a bridge to other opportunities. So you bring someone on, you teach them the ropes, but it takes a certain mentality and commitment. It's hard. It's really hard. Yeah, and sometimes we get- Mentorship is no, easy, like, yeah. Yeah, and like we get clients to pay for it and we've been more successful now saying, hey, you know, a double the line uh, cell animator will cost you, you know, I don't know, 3,000, 4,000 more for like, you know, whatever short period of time. And they'll, they say, oh yeah, I see value in that. Sometimes they don't, or they, they just can't. Um, and then we'll absorb the cost. So I think yeah. it just takes like an extraordinary amount of commitment and, um, and, and just sort of focus to think about like, there's a monoculture in design. How are we going to change it? And it's tactical, hard ass work <laughs> that most people don't want to do. Well, it takes time. So from a, well, and, and from an educator's yeah. educator's perspective, would that look something like if I have a diverse student, actively trying to connect them with a diverse mentor? Is that yeah? Is that the way? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah. I would say. Also, we kind of like redefine what allyship allyship means in the diversity and inclusion space, right? Because I think a lot of times when you say it, the word allyship, it tends to mean, oh, you know what? There's a really good white designer who is going to help this minority junior to work, right? But I think when you redefine allyship as a even handshake yeah. of uh, anybody can be an ally. If you are, you know, you're a woman, you can ally a white male. If you're a oh, white male, God. you can ally someone, male. you know, like that, because you gain something in return, um, no matter what, you gain a, a new perspective, you gain anything. But if you are teaching in school, for example, Austin, like for example, we teach, you know, you teach typography. If you look at typography, you would teach them you know, the, the masters, right? The Swiss and the, all that. And what if you just say, hey, you know what? There are a lot of amazing Thai countries out there by Latinx, by, you know, uh, other minorities, Thai countries you can look at. And what we're not doing, we're not forcing it on them, but we make them aware that there is also a lack of diversity in the type design world. You know, and then there are many options out there. You can just like start exploring and kind of like looking at that. Imagine you buy a typeface from a from a Latinx type foundry. That makes a big difference. Imagine if a brand would choose to work with a type foundry like that from the get go and make that a thing. You know, for like I don't know, big big giant enterprise. What would that do? What would the impact be? Yeah. That is a big deal because access is everything, right? Access is everything. And it like, yeah, like when I hear you guys talk about it, like it, right? Well, the thing that's kind of challenging is that now with the way things are set up with how schedules are, it is hard to do that. It is hard to invest in something that's going to inherently slow down the process maybe, you know, but yeah. And, you, and we have to acknowledge that. But at the same time, there's also like, 
when you do that, every once in a while, you get like somebody that knocks it out of the park that who's who just absorbs and becomes just like an integral member of your team without question, you know? Yeah. We've had and that many times. That don't, yeah. And even for the people that don't, like you say, it's like, well, they've had this amazing experience and then can move on and have that on their resume and have a character reference and have all of that stuff that they wouldn't have necessarily had before. So it's, it's a big deal. It also just sets a vibe in your studio. That's different, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's okay, another important giving someone important, a shot. Okay. Go on. No, I was just saying yeah. it's about giving someone a shot. It's about like going out on a limb, taking a risk where our industry is very yeah. risk averse. You know, and to so, to make a yeah. change, you you have to do that. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things that we can do in general in, in our industry. It's so interesting whenever we bring somebody new in, like a new freelancer or any kind of any kind of new, <laughs> we always <laughs> have somebody that we're booking that is also tried and true or an internal person so that like just in case something happens with this person, whether it's a character thing or a quality thing or whatever that we're covered just in case. So we tend to like have one or two of those things going on at a time so that it's not like we're, we're stacked up with like, oh my God, if all these people don't work out, it's like, okay, if one person doesn't work out, we're gonna be okay. If another person doesn't work out, we're gonna be okay. It's not like the whole ship is sinking. So there's a way to kind of like make this part of your, your system without necessarily getting into too much risk, you know? Yeah, Which is how I yeah. Do how I would have and am adopting some of this thinking, you know, putting it into practice. And in that way, it is a practice, you know, it's not always going to go well. And it's not always going to go poorly either. There's, there's, it's, it's a practice, you kind of got to get used to doing that. And the people at the, the office have to get used to doing it too. So it, it will be work, but it's worthy. Work. We consider it like a shared responsibility for the studio. Yeah. Aaron. It's like I think yeah. for us, um, everyone cares about the same objective, right? To help right. whoever comes through the door to achieve the goal. So, um, in a way, it will be less taxing if you don't put all that on one person. But right. you know, divide it between like the producer and the art director. You in charge of this one tidbit, yeah. and then at the end, they would get a, a cumulative knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of I'm, I'm still processing the whole, yeah. the whole bridge, the bridge studio idea and thinking about it as like a bridge educator, right? And it's how I, brilliant. right. That, you know, and, and, and linking, linking people up, which is, I mean, it's something I think I've, I've done, there's been organically doing it, but to be just a little more conscious and intentional and, and, um, I don't know if that's not risk averse isn't the word, but I guess it's, it's that kind of worrying about like oh is, is is there an etiquette or am i am i stepping am i am i crossing boundaries and and i which i guess brings us you know that next idea or next question is like the what should we not do um, well, that's a great question. in trying to advance the the inclusivity yeah i mean i i totally hear you because obviously i hear it from your i'm trying to step in your shoes right now right. austin right i'm like if i'm a white male and a teacher, um, I don't want to say shit that would be, would be misinterpreted um, yeah. and then read as like, oh, uh, am I doing this because I'm the minority in the room and you giving me special care, special attention, right? Um, yeah. To me, it's, it's first it has to come from a good place. Like to us, uh, we got this question in the past, like how, how is what you're doing different than tokenism? Right. Like if we just say, oh, you bring on we bring on diverse, uh, you know, talents and stuff like that. Well, my answer is a question like, is it tokenism when our entire company is completely diverse? Right. Like I think tokenism is when you have just one type, one perspective and you try to bring on someone just because. So in a way, I think what we do is we have to balance, um, we have a delicate balance to, to, to play with here, right? At the same time, we have to be honest with ourselves that no good work can be done unless you get your hands dirty. 
um, you have to forego some political correctness and you have to come from a good place that you have a good intention to help this person and to help the industry. And it's not a one-time thing because we got a job that has to do with some Hispanic market thingy that we bring on that person for, right? It should be a consistent effort uh, and, and uh, there's a longevity to this program or yeah. this commitment to it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting. Like I get, like I almost want to ask you guys when you listen to this podcast back, and right? maybe I am asking and, and just kind of dancing around that. If I say anything that's absolutely insane, please let me know and I'll cut it out because <laughs> I am so worried about cancel, cancel culture. But I, when I talk about things, I talk very openly and like I'm okay making mistakes, but I'm okay on behalf of me making mistakes. I don't want to make like a misstep on other people. And when you have a platform and are more visible, like the last thing I would ever want to do is offend anybody. And I'm very happy to be educated, but with cancel culture being so intense right now, I, I get very scared about talking about this. Even in our season one, I said to Austin, I said, until we have some, real information about like diversity, inclusion, equity, even as a woman, I don't feel comfortable talking about it. It's not my area of expertise. And while I feel like we're doing some work here, like we're not like, it's different. It's just different. So I, I would get very worried about opening my mouth sometimes and talking about things because I worry that even though my intentions might be good, sometimes it doesn't matter what your intentions are. People are just going to go for the throat. I yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, council culture is sort of, it, it's something that has evolved and mushroomed and it's this big thing. But, you yeah. know, I, I believe that if, if you're the type of person that is self-aware, who's open and honest mm -hmm. and has an attitude of like, I want to be educated, I'm, I'm thinking about this and I don't know, then I think it's yeah much easier for someone to, to interpret it in a way that's not toxic and that's not like abrasive. Um, you know, I think it's yeah. all about how you ask questions and how you say things. If you come at people with this sort of like, aggressive nature and you're saying these things that you hold to be true, then I think people can definitely, that can backfire. But I think as long as it comes from a good place and a, and a point of curiosity and wanting to know and wanting to understand because we, we don't know everything about everyone. Um, I think that's what's most important. And then I'll also say like in general, like we gotta have these conversations. Like we, we just gotta, and we, we gotta get people yeah from diverse backgrounds. That means, you know, just anyone um, together to talk, you know, like that's something that this country in general has avoided. Um, and it's uncomfortable and it can be uncomfortable, but you know, you, to work through things, you know, you, you gotta sometimes be open to being uncomfortable and, and to making yeah. mistakes, you know? Yeah, Austin, to go back to your question, right? What should we not do? I think the worst thing we should not do is nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. You think about yeah. it. If we just stand still and say that problem is too big, it's too sensitive. Let's not touch that. That's the worst thing you can do. By choosing not to partake or to have a conversation about it or even ask questions in the first place. That's the worst thing you, you can do. Yeah, I agree with that, man. 100 percent. Right. So crazy. I, you know, I double the line i've no i don't know how i haven't heard about that <laughs> but what a great way to to handle it Aaron, what you know honestly because i i have lot tons of, of clients that would be super on board with that super yeah in a heartbeat a lot of people a lot of people haven't heard about it and it's i think it's one of these things where you know, someone came up with this idea and it sounded great and it never like super took off because I would say more yeah. people have not heard about it. And we heard about it through a client who said, hey, we want you to do this. We were like, oh, shit, this is genius. Um, and I think it's just one of those things. You know, there's so many things that came up and they came and they went, you know, 
people have these great mm-hmm. intentions, but 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 again, who is doing that? Like it, it can be difficult. Like you said, it may slow down the work a little bit. It may be a little bit more expensive, but it's actually super simple. You know, it's, I think it doesn't if we have just to be. ask our clients like, hey, is this a double the line job? Can we do that for you? Like right when we're bidding a job, just have it be a yeah. question that we ask yeah. like, hey, like this is something we are very excited about doing. If you're up for it, I get it. If I get also if costs are an issue, we have other jobs we're already doing it on, you know, but I think they would be yeah, now and The other way you can think about that is that it's a very flexible way mm-hmm. to do social impact because totally. uh, a double the line can be for the entire job or can be or for cell animation or yeah, for just, just compositing or just for design, you know, you can apply it in many phases of production, only one phase of production. It depends on the, the, the risk tolerance of the job, yeah. the budget, the schedule, you know, so many factors. Or just you to know, say like, also, hey, we'd like to try doubling the line on, you know, with a 2D animator and a 3D animator and an editor on your job. Is that something you're cool with? Just to say like, this is what yeah. we have available. Are you interested? I, I love this. This is Isn't so it cool? Simple. Like we get so excited, Aaron. Like this is one of the things that we're yeah. so excited about, right? And it's so easy. And the other thing is, this uh, double the liner gets to be on this huge job, see everything behind the scenes, right? Like I, I don't know about you guys, but we do a lot of Slack. 100%. We we do a lot of like you know client calls. So that person's on those client calls. They get introduced to the client. The yeah. client sees this person. They love it, right? But. Yeah. It's just like building that confidence, building that experience level. And now with, you know, uh, everything being Zoom, it's so easy to do. And like my question to anyone listening is why not do it? Like seriously. Why and and it's also from a studio perspective, it helps you build your pipeline. Right. So it's there's so many wins. It's like ridiculous that everyone's not doing it. So please do it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, and also from an from an educator standpoint, that is something you can offer studios. You can say, I have my students, and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not saying ethnicity is a case here, right? I, you're not gonna tell them I have a minority student or whatever. I have a student who's really good, who would be great to shadow part of your production and gain that knowledge to go into an industry, you know, like mm-hmm. right on graduation. Right on. Right on. Yeah, that's that's kind of what's been going on in my head as I'm listening. Is I'm like, okay, how can how can we feed feed students in this in some kind of uh, yeah apprenticeship mentorship model? I mean, I know there's the official internship channel, but is there is there something else that it doesn't have to be an official internship? Can they can they just kind of shadow a production? Yeah. Well, you what's know, great Austin, about double the line is they're getting paid. Everybody's getting paid. It's coming from commerce you know that mm-hmm. it's essentially the economy is supporting the initiative and not the burden on that like again the burden shouldn't just be on the studio owner to make huge social impact it's got to be shared throughout the process so like okay yeah it's gonna bog maybe a designer down a little bit to get somebody up to speed it's gonna you know there's gonna be definitely impact here but at least we're getting paid for it or sharing some of the cost with the client or Again, who cares why as long as it's happening? Yeah. yeah. Who cares why? As long I would as say it also on the business side, Aaron, like that's a way you can retain your clients, right? I mean, 100%. clients want to align with people who yeah. do good work. Yeah. It's like what you said Absolutely. earlier, Aaron, about why you love Apple, right? Because branding, it all comes back to a sense of belonging, right? Like we align with brands that represent our philosophies, our thoughts, who we want to be. And that that translates for clients for us and for our studios as well, right? Like clients, they they wanna be a certain way, they they wanna contribute, they wanna, you know, make a social impact. If we as companies are making that social impact and allows them to do it through us, then that's that's yeah. something that they, you know, that's a differentiator um, and reason for working with studios who are doing these things. What should students be learning? You know, it's interesting. This is like a, an adjacent thing, something uh, 
Austin, that you were talking from like a teaching perspective. Austin and I are kind of working on this idea of just this notion that graphic design should include motion design, should include motion. It's so interesting though, like, cause changing education is like so hard. <laughs> <laughs> like to even suggest that a graphic design curriculum include motion as a core component means like basically changing the fundamental of designs back to like the printing press days, <laughs> you know, but well, yeah. nobody's reading things on printed things anymore. They're looking at things on their friggin' phones. You know what I mean? Like Right. And the, the metrics, right? I mean, when, when you do the whole data driven, it's like that motions what captures people's attention. attention like that's what's effective so it's yeah i mean i had this conversation with a student the other day where they were looking at um they were like oh i'm doing 36 days of type and i was like oh that's cool and then they were they were like oh there's some really cool motion stuff up there and that <laughs> brought up this whole like yeah and and that if you go back i don't you know I think that that whole initiative is like a 10 years old, right? Like, I'd be curious, actually now I want to track, like, okay, I want to see how much more motion is on 36 days of type in the last 10 years, right? And, yeah. and as a little bit of a, I don't know, um, proof of, of concept for, hey, yeah, motion design as, motion as a pillar of graphic design. Yeah, yeah. and I, to me, what's interesting is uh, if you think about it, Graphic design is a time-based, uh, I don't know what you call that, like profession, right? It's like we, you build, what do you do with graphic design? You build hierarchies. You want people to look here first before you look somewhere else. Yeah, um, It's based on words, which requires a sequence of like one A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. It's all motion, really. It's just your eyes. Hundred percent. I gotta write it. I gotta write stuff you down. Gotta write that down. Graphic design is time-based media. I like it that. is because what we were taught is like where we're moving our eye in a still. Okay, first you're gonna read the headline, mm -hmm. then I'm gonna move you to here. Maybe the first thing that captures your interest is the image, you know, the illustration or the photography. But as a designer, you're telling a story in one image. So, but now we have the luxury of like, okay, now we have the image and the type comes in, and it's a little bit, you know. Oh, that's so great. That is like the best way I've ever heard it explained. The best way I've ever heard it explained. Can we have that? Can we borrow that? <laughs> we'll Absolutely. quote you on it. Yours. Yeah. <laughs> what is design activism? It's interesting. Well, is there anything that we anything we missed or anything that you guys want to want to talk about in context to this conversation? Yeah, kind of just one more thing just about just design with um, not for and just like the idea of uh, kind of social activism through design. Like I think um, mm -hmm. most people, I, not all, but I think most people want to feel like a sense of fulfillment, you know, with their jobs. And I've gone through this a lot. I was like, you know, you know, we're designing for tech companies or animating XYZ for you know, this yeah. product or in advertising is like, what, you know, what am I contributing? Right? Like, what, what is like, what is my profession contributing, you know, to greater to the, the greater good in terms of society? And, and yeah, and that's something that I, I really kind of stress in terms of like inclusive motion design and just, you know, thinking like a bridge studio is like, this is a way for us to, to give back, this is a way to make a change to make an impact. Um, and that's just something like that I think is appealing to many, many people in design and in motion design particularly is like it, it's not just about, you know, art and commerce. It, it, it can be so much more if you make it, if you have that mentality, if you think about it that way, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah I, say, I would say like design activism, you know, has been around forever and we as studio owners, individuals, freelancers, whoever, work for a company. Most of our time, we think about what we create. It's not always going to be exciting all the time. You will have to work on a lot of projects that we consider to be, you know, boring. Let's say it that way, right? <laughs> but when you focus about, yeah, well, well, I'm going to say NTAX can be really exciting. I love, I love NTAX. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but, uh, 
I'm saying that when you stop thinking about what you create, but what's going on behind the scenes, what it takes to make that, mm -hmm. or who it takes to make that, or who you can help to make that, it changes uh, things. The work is no longer about whether it's beautiful, boring. You're actually making a social impact because your focus is behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, what you make, why you make it, how you make it. You know? I gotta switch my earbuds real quick. They died. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> but I wanted there was something I wanted to add, but I'm I'm gonna switch and resync. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's really impactful because because yeah, I think most people you know see even our studio like our our website has a lot of beautiful work on there, and certainly the other work that we do is beautiful too. But it, that is not all of the work we do. We do a ton of other work that either we can't show or, um, you know, we don't want to for some reason. It's all goes like into, um, cause it kind of dilutes the message. Like what, like part of having a portfolio is editing to the portfolio. Mm -hmm. So this not only is the work we've done, but directionally where we want to go. And so that's the reason you would, or make it more aspirational, but you know, all that work exists and we send it out in reels when you want to get jobs. So it's all kind of, working for us but there are lots of reasons you would be excited about your job and i think my for me the biggest thing i love about work you know it used to be the work the design doing the work and doing big high profile work but now i just love my team i and even when people come and go um I like laughing all day. I like talking. I like even when people leave and they go and do something great, I still feel like so much pride in that. Like I was a, somehow a part of it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And, and that's a different like level of of being. And I think that's what you're a little bit talking about. It's like how we all influence each other and yeah. kind of. That makes you, Aaron, a Bridge Network studio owner. There we go. Right. That's, uh, <laughs> and you know, like, I think when you stop acting like an owner and acting like a coach, yes, that, that's when it changes. When you're yeah. not telling people what to do, you're not asking people what we, yeah. you can get out of them. Right. But what they can, you can work with them and like yeah. think about their long term growth instead right. of what they can contribute to your studio. Yeah. My big thing is I don't, as like a, like an executive creative director. Sometimes my job is to go in there and be like, you're doing great. I wouldn't, even if I would do something different, like you're doing great, you're knocking it out of the park. Everybody's happy, everybody feels ownership, you're happy. Like, it's not on me to like, I've already influenced it. I've hired you, I've trained you, we brought in mm -hmm. this team. If it needs some impact and influence in a certain way, and I feel that I'll come in and like, we'll have a chat, but like, I, like just having like the confidence and and if something's going weird like I can come in and be like okay who who do I have to talk to to take the punch you know my job is to take the hit not my team you know what I mean like I, even if I had nothing to do with it I'm like what's going on okay I'll call and <laughs> I'll take the swing and then I'll defend you and then I'll help you know usher it back into your hands <laughs> so that somebody got had to take the hit but it's always got to be me that takes the hit that's the big thing i don't want my team to take it like i have total confidence in them so and that's a big yeah. thing because like most people are like, i'm not taking the hit i didn't do anything wrong but i'm like well sometimes people just need to be mad at somebody and who better than to be mad at than the person whose name is on the company <laughs> So, so I'll go take it, you know, I don't, it doesn't make me like, it makes me feel bad, like something's going on, but it doesn't, it doesn't hurt my identity, you know, and I always know that there's a path forward. So, but it's interesting. It's interesting. Run towards the fire. Don't run away. That's my philosophy. Yeah. What I, were you going to say, Austin? That. I was waiting for you. Yeah. Run oh, the I was just going to say with the, the design activism, you know, and just, just a personal, like my own experience with it, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, like after, you know, with the George Floyd and, and, 
there there's, there was a time where I just felt like all right I I needed to use some of my skills to just say and I guess it was the start of the pandemic so we all had mm-hmm. more time in our hands and 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 um, yeah. I don't know I, I it's just I I started just making stuff and posting stuff and and being more vocal about it and and using my skills to make a statement and just felt like I I needed to I just felt like I can't not say something you know and 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 the experience for me it, it it actually you know reflecting on being a commercial artist creating work for clients being a professional in that context but creating this other set of work that that was more it just connected to a passion and 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 really just made me excited about making in a way that was different mm. you know and, and it felt and feels important right like this is there's a real meaning behind it and and um i don't know i i think for me it's just it being an important and and uh valuable experience as as a creative and as a person right yeah. and and just being able to kind of you know it's, i have these skills i have this position of privilege that how could i not stand up how could i not say something um for different groups that I, are important to me because not only like you know, I have people in my life and I have students in my life who are represented in these groups, but just because I'm a human, <laughs> right? And like, yeah. yeah, yeah, wanting the world to be a better place. Yeah, yeah, and that's what it's all about, Austin. It's it's all about we're all humans. We're all more alike than we are different. And the the world, I think, is getting better and, and we can continue to push it to, to, to improve and to evolve and... I think it's like it's not a marathon. I mean, it's not a it's not a sprint. It's a marathon, you know, and that's what's happening right now. So many people had these great intentions, you know, their energy levels are waning and now they're getting back to, you know, normal life. The pandemic is over and George Floyd is a few years behind us and people, you know, kind of just move on. Um, So I think it's our jobs, you know, to try to continue pushing and try to keep that energy going and not give up and keep moving for the next generation. You know, that's the hard part <laughs> is continually doing the hard work in the trenches day in, day out, day in, day out. Yeah. And I think the important thing here is that people in our community, in our industry are in those trenches, are boots on the ground to create popular yeah. culture. I mean, that's what you see everywhere. It has some graphic designer's hand in it, a motion designer's hand in it, Mm -hmm. social media, TV. You turn your head and you see our work. So if we have a mentality to change the perception of that world, imagine, right, the impact. That's a great way of putting it. That is great. Like little decisions we make can change things. Little, little small just little things. Is there. Yeah. Tactical small things, but you just got to keep doing them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been a really great chat. I can't thank you guys enough. Yes, thank you thank so you much. Awesome. <laughs> I appreciate you, and I can't believe we're all, almost two hours in, and it felt like fifteen minutes. I can. <laughs> <laughs> it did feel fast, but I, you know, it was a lot to talk about, and you guys like have such grace and courtesy and curiosity around it and yeah i really appreciate it i think people are going to really enjoy this talk because it's not just talking about um what's wrong it's talking about uh what's actually getting better and how to like actually do little things right some concrete steps yeah like you said, to, tactical to concrete practice. hey this is yeah that's it yeah so. One last thing I'm going to throw out there, that. Aaron, is we, we just, I don't know if when this episode comes out, if it will be public, but we um, uh, signed on with School of Motion to uh, give scholarships to eight diverse uh, designers slash animators. So that's another thing that's like totally doable. You know, it's a tactical, small thing. It's like, hey, give people a scholarship yeah. because a lot of people from these backgrounds, they can't afford to go to school or go back to school. You know, so like right. these small little things, that's what Hung and I are all about is, um, is, you know, talking the big picture, the big strategy, but 
having these little small things like you know it's not really we, we call it tactical we we call it tactical emoji like for example uh with the scholarships it's easy to kind of as a studio say here's some money scholarship take the course but we don't want to do that alone we want to know what impact that would have so what we're going to do is we're going to do pre-interviews with them we want to understand where they want to go with a career, we recommend a course, and then we also going to give them a survival kit to I start. Yeah. So we call the BN Motion the survival kit, and that would like include a dictionary of all the terms studios usually use when they talk about, you know, what is a hold? You know, like all mm -hmm. these things that they would should know if they go into the industry as a freelancer, as a staff, whatever. Um, and actual business advices from Ricardo in terms of like, when you reach out to people, do a cold email, what you should do <laughs> from the creatives in some like what we're looking for as the perfect collaborator and from a producer in terms of like, what you should do to make sure the producer would love you to death and book you again. Right. So very Soft tactical skills. information. Soft skills. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Right on. And that's the stuff we like to talk about. It's not so much like what's being made. It's like what to expect, oh, you know, for somebody yeah. that's leaving school and going into the world. What is it like at a studio? And what, what are the things you could make with motion? Just like literally just like let's start thinking of it as a culture and not just as a profession that you of a thing that you make. It's not just a factory where you go and make this thing. It's it, there's a culture around motion design and business practices around motion design that just aren't talked about. Most times people just go and look at, you know, whoever the cool designer of the day is talk at FIGC, which I'm gonna be in a couple of days. But like, you know like what I mean? Me. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like in the, you know, it's been G-Monk and people and all these people where it's just like, you know, for, for us, for Austin and I, we've always talked about like, okay, how do you move from the academic environment into a professional environment if you're not at SCAD or Ringling or Art Center or one of these like elite kind of motion design schools, you know what I mean? Like, how do, you, how do you prep your portfolio? What does it look like? What are people thinking when they look at your work? What happens if you don't hear back? Should you send it again? Like, what does that mean? So really kind of creating Right. Just how content to, navigate. to talk about that stuff, how to think about it. So what you're doing is so practical too. I love it. I love practical solutions. That's like one person at a time, you know, two people at a time. Yeah. And the idea of a bridge network studio is basically we would hope that we can get to become a bridge studio network where many studios can pull okay. resources together and bring people together. For example, if we had someone coming through our studio that was really great, I want yeah. to pass her or him to or them to you, Aaron, and say, this person has been great. You. Take now, you can level up because we do see us here and you here, so now it's time to go to Swarovski and level yeah. up, right? And imagine if that person get to go somewhere else. Imagine yeah. in five years, how, where is that person's gonna be? I totally, you know? back at Apple. <laughs> <laughs> in house, making all the money. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's, in house. That's going to be, but that's going to be the person who's going to change the branding of Apple yes, to make exactly. sure that Austin can see what he saw. Exactly. <laughs> right. This is all making me think of. The, you guys remember the spot, the the girl effect. Oh, I love you know, the girl yeah. effect. Yeah. The girl effect, like yeah, yeah, I mean that whole idea of like, you know, the change builds right one that one at a time yeah oh yeah right totally all right cool well, i awesome. think this and is then, it and then at some point yeah yeah some point in the future maybe next year i want to talk to you guys about getting maybe even getting you out for a workshop i think that would be really He's cool so do you ever yeah. like does it doesn't have to just be motion right it could just be like design we, right? yeah we have yeah. uh we worked out a pretty fun workshop so yeah, yeah that's fun it's not it's a serious topic but it's, it can be fun Awesome. But uh, before I go, I just want to really say thank you, Aaron and Austin, thank for having you. us. Thank really you, guys. Thank yeah. you, guys. Hey, we appreciate it so much. This is awesome. Always. Hope everybody has a great weekend, and uh, we'll talk Always. soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you both awesome. so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next Between the Keyframes.